Unfortunately, there is no way to build a procedural pyraminx, so I will have to build it manually. If you want, you can skip ahead and play the next chapter, but I would recommend following because there is something to learn for every level of Cinema 4D users. So I will start by first creating not a pyramid, but a platonic primitive object change its type to tetra, also change the display type to something with lines, increase the segments to 3 and then make the object editable. Then I will switch to rectangle selection, change my mode to polygons, enable tolerance selection and then select the polygons that will make up one piece of this. Actually, its official name is Pyraminx. I checked on the Wikipedia. After selecting the polygons that I know will make a piece, I will separate them to its own object by using the split command. The user shortcut for it is UP. And to make it easier for me to visualize what I'm doing, I will enable viewport solo single and viewport solo selection. After splitting the parts that I want in a separate object, I will delete the original piece and from there continue with the other pieces. Separate them and delete the original piece. Separate them and delete the original piece. I don't know why the solo mode is not working. Viewport solo selection, yes, that's right. Now I have to work only with the remaining polygons. UP, delete. This central part will make a piece of its own, so break it in its own object. I have to be careful not to select any part of the geometry that doesn't need to be there. So I have developed this technique where I cut away from the edges first so I don't take polygons that I don't need to. Okay. And last not least these ones. And now delete the original piece. So all I'm left with are these separate parts which I will now use the bridge tool in edge mode to fill in the missing polygons. This is how I will close the gaps. Go on to the next one and be careful not to leave the parts open. Be sure to check the geometry is closed. There are no open gaps. It may be tedious to do this work manually, but I didn't find a way to build this pyramid in a procedural way. This part has only one face to close. This should be the parts at the base of the pyramid. Nevertheless, be careful and check every part is properly closed. Okay. And we're ready to jump to the next part. Now I will select every object and connect them together into a single object again. I'm doing this because now I can add 
deformer bevel modifier and bevel them all together an offset of one may be a little too much so I'll drop it to 0 0.5 and I'll add one subdivision that's enough before converting the current state to a single object and delete this original one this is what I'm left with and now in the next part I will take care of UVing this object so that I can easily later on put any image as a texture and the image will display in a proper way for you to better understand my technique of laying out the UVs I will go ahead and create a platonic again make it editable and I will add four texture tags to this platonic each texture tag will represent one of the faces and I will rename them front bottom right and left I will make use of Expresso it may seem funny but keep watching now I will create a list of tags iterator tags change its type to texture get the object where the Expresso tag is attached to and feed its object info to the tags info to be sure that I've got all the tags of type texture selected I will get a print to console node drag one of the tags in here feed the tag to the object input and get the name out and voila you see that I've got all the texture tags into Expresso what I will do now I don't need their name I want to get an object index node so for each tag I can get an index out and this index I will feed to a polygon node I'm getting the info for the polygons of the object where the Expresso is attached to. I will feed the index to the polygon index and now I can get info for each polygon of the platonic object the info I need is the polygon normal why I'm doing this because for each face I want the texture tag to be projected along that face is normal to do that I will select all the tags change their projection type to flat and if I now change the mode to texture if you see now all the textures by default are pointing along the z-axis but for each face I want them to point along the normal of that face here are all the texture tags and I will feed that information to the rotation coordinates for each texture now I will have to convert this polygon normal data to rotation data and I will do it by going to calculate vector to matrix and then use another node matrix to HPB okay instead of feeding this HPB I will combine this data to a vector a reals to vector let me change the Expresso connection type to direct and now I will feed this vector to the rotation for each texture node and see how it jumped 
along the normal of this face. Let me check the others as well. I hope you understood what I was doing, but if not, go ahead and watch this video again. Now, I will disable this expressor node so that I don't accidentally ruin everything. Hide this newly created platonic, unhide the original one and drag all these tags to this original one. These are the projections that we are going to use to lay out the UVs for this Pyraminx puzzle. And that's what I'm going to do next. First of all, let me open two new windows. It is the new texture view. This is the UV window. Let me attach it here. And also the UV manager window. And let's link it here. Okay. If we drag one of these texture tags into the texture view, you will see the pyramid projected from their Z axis. So for each tag, I will create a projection only for the faces whose normals are aligned to the texture Z axis. I will go to polygons. Let me select these polygons here. And with the texture tag selected, I will go to tag assign UV coordinates. Here are the UV coordinates of the selected polygons and using the UV mapping editor, I will move them in another tile of the UV view. For the bottom, I will move them one unit down. Okay. The first one should be bottom. Let's go to the next texture. Let's see which direction it faces. I should have renamed the tags after I transform their orientation because now the order is not the right one because although my first tag was named front, it was oriented along the polygon whose index was zero. The polygon with the index zero was the one that was on the bottom of the pyramid. So I will have to rename the tags again. Sorry for that confusion. Now, this one, if we look at the bottom here, where are the world coordinates, corresponds to the front. I will rename this tag front and I will select the polygons that face along that direction. Here they are. With the texture tag selected, I'll go to the tag assign UV coordinates. And the front, I will leave it here where it is. The next texture is the right one. I will choose the polygons that face to the right direction. Only the main polygons, not the little ones that are beveled. And choose tag, assign UV coordinates. And for the right one, I will move them one unit in the UV coordinate space in the X direction. And let's do it for the last one, which are the polygons that face on the left direction. Again, tag, assign UV coordinates and move them minus one unit in the UV coordinates. As you can see, these are the main parts. And for all the rest, what I will do is select again these already laid out parts. And get the 
inverse of the polygons we had selected. I will scale them to zero and move them negative one in the x direction and negative one in the y direction. So here they are in a completely other tile of the UV coordinates. With that done, we have finished laying out the UVs for the pyraminx. Now that we have finished with the UVs, I will close these windows. I will add a new null, which is at the center of the world. Disable the solo command and parent this object under the null. What I will do now is move these textures to the parent object. Let's delete this simple platonic. We don't need it anymore. And by selecting all the polygons, I will go to the mesh commands and choose polygon groups to objects. Delete this first one that got generated. Now all the pieces are again separated, each one back as its own object. But if, if I go to model, you will see that all of them have their pivot at the center of the world. This is not what we want. I need to have each piece centered at its gravity center or better formulated at the center of all their points. I will do it using the axis center command and I want all the axes to be centered at the center of all points. And now, voila, each piece has the pivot at the center of all its points. Now I will go ahead and create materials for the pieces. Create a material for the front. And if you remember, we didn't transform the UV coordinates for the front faces, so I will write here 0, 0. And I'm doing it so that I can later reference to this transformation easily. I will apply it to the first texture tag. By default, this material overrides all the faces. So what I'm doing now is disable the tile property. And now you see that the front material only applies to the polygons whose UV coordinates are at the center of the UV view. Now, I will create another material for the bottom faces and the bottom faces UV was translated one unit down in the Y direction, applied at the down texture tag, also disable the tiling and offset V one unit down. Change its color, say something orange okay for the front color i was thinking was red and now the other one is the right texture let's create a new material for the right side the right side was one unit in the positive x direction of the uv coordinates let's change its color to blue or orange it's better sorry green disable tiling and move one unit in the y direction and the only one left from the main faces are the left ones left their coordinates was minus one and zero in the uv change the color to blue and disable tiling and move them minus one in the U direction. We shall have to create another material which will be black. I will rename it to all the rest. Their UV coordinates were minus one, minus one. I will position this new material to be the first in the row so that every other material overrides it. 
the coordinates were minus 1, minus 1. And now you can see that we have the pyraminx already UV'd and textured. The next phase will be setting it up. But first I will explain you some theory behind it and then we will apply the lessons learned there to the actual puzzle. Now comes the setting up of a custom constraint system. This is just the theory part. In the case of the Rubik's Cube, I used some simple combinations of Espresso nodes to build a kind of constraint system to drive the rotation of the small cubes around the center of, of the big one. If you remember, the scenario is as simple as this. For each little cube, we incrementally add to the rotation of an axis, then we decide which axis it's going to be, x, y or z. So I constantly increase a float value and then I decide to which channel of a vector I will apply that incrementally increasing value. In the cubes example, it happens to be that that axis of rotation matches perfectly to each of the local axes of the cube, which are perpendicular to each other. In the case of the pyramid, the axis around which the pieces should rotate is different for each possible move, because the pieces are going to rotate around an axis whose z direction aligns with the normals of the polygons of that face. There are four different faces and they are each 120 degrees apart from each other so that's totally different from 90 degree angle in the cubes case. Maybe this doesn't make a lot of sense now but Please bear with me and continue watching. Basically what I'm saying is that the setup of the cube doesn't work in the pyraminx case. I'm going to build a different type of constraint this time, a custom made one, using among other things a special node in Espresso, the invert matrix node. To better understand the invert matrix node, Think of it like this. It gives you a matrix that, when multiplied with the original one, results in a matrix that represents the origin of the world and a 0, 0, 0 position on all axes. This is helpful if you want to get the local matrix of an object. You just multiply its global matrix by the inverted matrix of itself and you get its local position from its global position and vice versa if you've got the local matrix of an object and you multiply it by the inverted value of that local matrix you get the global position of an object back so let me build this simple scene for you I will create a platonic and call it original, duplicate this object and call this second one preview, change its radius to something larger, say 105, and also add a display tag so that I can display this preview as lines. Here I've got the original object and here I've got a preview. I will also add a null and call this null offset. Change its display type to point. Okay, so here is the offset null. Now, let's add an Espresso tag, get the original object into the Espresso, get its, let's say its local matrix, or better yet, global matrix, add an invert node, 
change its data type to matrix. Okay. And I will add the preview object into the Expresso and feed this newly generated matrix, the inverted one, to the preview global matrix. And watch what happens. If I now move the original object in the X direction, the preview moves in the opposite direction. It's as if it's mirrored, but it's not exactly mirrored because if I now move in the Y direction, the preview object moves in the y direction as well but in the opposite side and the same happens with the z direction. At a first look you would think that the invert matrix node acts as kind of a mirror but that's not the case because if I now rotate the original object around say the y-axis you would think that the preview would rotate around the y-axis but in the opposite direction but look what happens the preview object rotates and it rotates around the y-axis but that y-axis is not at its center but at the center of the world if I now take the offset object take its global matrix and have this invert matrix multiplied by the global matrix of the offset object, the result will be the same. It still rotates around the world axis, but now if I rotate the offset object, its rotation drives the rotation of the preview object around its own center. And if I now invert this result again, you will see that the position of the preview object jumped at the center of the original one. But let's see how it reacts to the rotation. The original object rotates and the preview object follows. But now if I if I now rotate the offset the preview rotates but in the negative direction. What I can do now is multiply this result again but this time by the invert matrix of this offsets global matrix. Here it is. It's building this kind of a, a Rome shape. Trust me, we're almost there. The key thing to remember here is th this, let's call it pattern, with this rhombish shape in the middle. Because look what's now interesting, I can Instead of using this preview object, I can make reference to this original object. And now I can incrementally add to the rotation of this original object, similar to what we've done in the cube example. And the way I'm going to do it, I will use a matrix to PHB node. I'll use a constant node for the moment, change its data type to string, add a math add node, I will rotate around the z axis, combine these reels into a vector again, and now convert this vector, rotation vector, to a matrix by using a generate matrix node. Okay. Feed this rotation to the generate matrix node and replace this math multiply input. Let's go back. Don't worry about the position. The position goes to zero because we have fed nothing to the position of this generate matrix node, but we'll get to that later. 
And now watch what happens if we add to the Z rotation of the original object. The amount I'm going to add is 120. It doesn't matter, but in the case of the pyraminx, it is 120 degrees, which is one third of a full circle. And a full circle, we can write it down two times p, divide it by three, and divide it, as we said in the cubes example, divided by the transition time. In this case, I'll make it five frames. Watch what happens. Every time I update or refresh my viewport, the pyramid rotates around the z-axis of the world coordinates because at the moment the offset object is aligned to the axis of the world. But if I rotate the offset to this custom angle, you will see that the pyramid still rotates around its z-axis. What if we want the pyramid to be offset from the center? Well, to do that, we can add another multiply node, or let's rather copy it from here. We can add another multiply node. Let's make this default to 1, the rotation. Let's reset it, and now we can offset in the y direction, or in whichever direction we want. And this is the setup I will use for the pyramid pieces. Remember this setup. I will rebuild it again in the next chapter when we build the setup of the pyramid pieces. Before we jump to that, I will reset everything. I will also reset the offset, reset the preview and let's for the moment disable the espresso and reset the original. Why? I want to prove the point. I want to align the offset object to the normal of one of the faces of this pyramid and I will choose the preview object for this. Now let's go to the structure manager change its mode to polygon, go to the polygons of the preview, and let's see, for example, which face we want to rotate around. Let's say this right one, and its index is 2. Why did I do this? Because now I want to align the offset to the normal of the polygon with index 2 of the preview, because that is the way the pieces the pyraminx are going to rotate. They are going to rotate around the normals of the four sides of the pyramid. So what I'll do is drag the preview, output its object info, get a polygon node. The index we want is 2. Output the polygon normal for the polygon with the index 2. Calculate using vector to matrix. Now we got a new matrix, but let's reset the position of this new matrix. So I'm going to make matrix to vectors. Okay. Use a vector to matrix. Let's now connect the information for the rotation but not the offset because we want the offset to be zero and now let's feed this matrix to the offset objects global matrix and let's check it okay now as you see the offset object is oriented along the normal of the polygon with index 2 changing the index number we can change the orientation of the offset. Okay. And now I will re-enable again this other Expresso node and see that we are now rotating around 
this direction, which is the direction of the normal of the polygon. And if we want to rotate around this other face, all we have to do is come to this offset and change its polygon index to say zero and it will rotate around the bottom well it kind of did but constantly updating both expressos messes things up but we will do it right when we set up our pyramid you got the idea now how i'm going to build it Now I'm back to our scene and in order to keep the video short and consistent I've gone ahead and prepared some of the steps and now I'm going to explain exactly what I've done. So first of all I've added an Expresso node to the master of the pieces and I've gone ahead and created all these different user data, the on off switch to turn on or off our simulation, the reset pyramid switch to reset and send all the pieces to their original position and orientation. I have added some custom data to each of these Fong tags that belong to each separate piece and in these tags I have stored the position and rotation of each piece in its reset state. And that's what I'm going to load by switching this button on or off. I also have the option to decide how long the transition is going to be in time. After that, I have 16 different buttons, one for each allowed move in the game, in the puzzle. So the way it's going to work is that for each axis the pieces that are going to rotate are as follows the base and the tip for the bottom axis the axis that points along the normals of these faces the pieces that can be rotated are the bottom base in the positive or negative direction and the tip in the positive or negative direction then there is the front so only the base can be rotated at one time or the tip in the positive or negative direction and so on for the left side and for the right side okay now i have set up this condition node change its data type to matrix and i have connected these constants to this condition node and in these constants is stored the matrix for each axis along which the pieces are going to rotate here is stored the matrix for the bottom axis the axis that points along the normals of the bottom face the front axis this one the left axis and the right axis right here so whenever i change these buttons the pieces are going to rotate around the predefined axis now another thing i have done is i have called all the objects with this hierarchy node all the objects that are children to this null and i have output the local matrix so we will try and recreate the same setup that we had previously and for that i'm going to add an invert node change its data type to matrix math multiply node change its data type also to matrix and the function to multiply and multiply this by the axis then copy and paste these nodes both of them and i'm going to multiply these again with this matrix and here we have created that rhombish shape and now we invert the resulting matrix and feed it back to each object hierarchy object and feed it back to the local matrix until now nothing has changed but we can now incrementally increase the rotation here at this spot 
and so we're going to add the matrix to HPB node let me zoom here make more space add a moth node again if you remember a reals to vector node now I will get a generate matrix node feed it to the rotation and before messing everything up I will get a tag node tag for each object I will get that reset data information the tag type will be fong drag one of the fong tags inside it doesn't matter which one connect it to the object input and get out the reset information which is a matrix okay and now we add a condition here change its data type to matrix and what will drive this condition is this reset pyramid switch so whenever the switch is on it will output this matrix and whenever it's off it will output this matrix now we can easily connect this generate matrix let's see what we've done is it on no it's off well now it seems that i've messed everything up but don't worry that's why i have done this part of the setup where I can reset back the pyramid don't worry this happens because this generate matrix node has only its rotation information connected and the position is at zero so how can we put back everything in its place first let me reset pyramid how do we put it in this state we have to add just one more multiplication after this invert and what are we going to multiply it by we're going to multiply it by this reset states matrix so instead of feeding it from here I'm going to copy and paste this part of the setup From each Fong tag, I will get the reset state. Here I am, and connect it here. Here it is. Until now, nothing has changed, but there's always a but. Now we can incrementally add to this Z rotation. And first, I'm going to do it with a constant node, just like we did. In the previous example, I'll set its data type to string and write down this formula 2 times pi divided by 3, which is 360 divided by 3 gives us 120 degrees. Uh, that amount of degrees we want to be rotated in the amount of time that the transition gets us, let's say, 5 frames. And now let us connect this to this add node and watch what happens. One, two, three, four, five. So in five frames, all these pieces are rotated around the bottom axis. Let's see which axis was selected. Yes, indeed, it was the bottom axis. Let us rotate the pieces along the front face. One, two, three, four, five the left one two three four five the left is this side here now let's do the same for the right one two three four five one two three four five you see where this is going don't you and 
at any moment we can reset the pyramid to its original position. I'm not going to rebuild the timer setup that I used in the cubes example. So I've gone ahead and prepared a preset of that setup, which is this one. And just so you see that it's exactly the setup that I built during the custom timer setup video. Here are all the nodes. And this is quite a handy way of managing complex set of nodes. You can group them together and create custom X groups. Just be careful to output all the inputs and outputs of this custom set of nodes. I will take this custom timer and instead of using this constant string, I will use it in combination with the timer, get information out of this expressor node and connect it to the corresponding inputs of the custom timer node on off. Transition length. Repeat. Selected faces. Okay. Now, this custom timer node will output only zeros and ones. So, I will add this result to the custom string. Switch the data type of this math node to string. So, instead of saying divided by 5, the result will say divided by the number that comes out of this timer node. But, as I said, the number that comes out of this timer node is only 0 or 1, so I will have to multiply it by the transition length before feeding it to the input of this add node. And let us check what we have done. I will play the time forwards. Nothing seems to happen. Oh, because the setup is not turned on yet. So, what I have done now is I have made the cube work in its entirety. So, whenever I change a face, the setup turns itself on for the length of the transition time and then turns itself off again. I can reset the setup and change the faces. Well, I have to be sure that the changes are done within the interval of the transition length. This is fine and good. Now there is another matter to be solved and I'm talking about the sense in which the pieces are going to be rotated. So when I say bottom base plus, the cubes should be rotated in the clockwise direction. And when I say bottom base minus, the cube should be rotated in the counterclockwise direction. The same for the base tip and the base tip minus. I thought of a way to solve this problem. If you look carefully, we can see that the base plus and base minus is a repeating pattern that repeats itself every two times. So, I will take the select face info, feed it to a math node, change its function to modulo and change the input to 2. What this will give us, it will give us ones and zeros. So whenever the index of the face I am selecting is an odd number, it will output one. And whenever it's even, it will output zero.
let me demonstrate it to you I will get a print to console node now bottom base plus is 0 bottom base minus is 1 bottom tip plus is 0 bottom tip minus is 1 and so on and so on so each time the output is 0 I will get a condition node and each time the output is 0 we need to multiply the result coming from the timer by 1 and each time the output is 1 we will multiply the result by minus 1 okay let me add another input here and let us now check what we have done I will play the animation again let me first make the maximum time longer let's say 250 frames play forwards now if I click base minus the pyraminx rotates in the negative sense let me prolong the transition length to 10 frames and let us check it again here it is in the negative sense positive sense negative sense positive sense negative sense you see now all that remains is to create some kind of filtering so that we can filter all the base pieces when we have checked base face the tip pieces when we have selected the tip faces and that is what I'm going to do next Now we're at the part where we create a filtering system. To make it easier to visualize, I will add a null object, change its display type to point, x, z orientation, and change its aspect ratio to something big, like 10. So the z direction is along this long line. Now, what I will do is drag this newly created null in the Espresso editor and feed this matrix info to the global matrix of this null what we will see is that whenever we change this select face menu the newly created null faces the direction of the normals of that particular face and that will make it easier for us to visualize. The setup I'm going to build is not different at all from the setup we have already created, but instead of having to grab noodles from these in and outputs, I will create it here instead, where I have more space and you can visually follow me better. I will get this matrix out and get a copy of all the pieces that make up this pyraminx puzzle invert its matrix okay I will have a multiply and after that I will invert the matrix again so what I've done I have converted the matrices for all the pieces into the local matrix of this null that gets the information from these inputs and I have inverted this matrix again back what will filter the pieces into the pieces that get updated and the pieces that won't get updated is their distance from the center in the Z position 
So that is what I will have to check. So in order to do that, I will grab a matrix to vector node. And after that, I will grab a vector to reals node. I want to check the offset. So that is what I'm connecting here. Get a print to console node. And what I'm interested in is the Z coordinate. Here it is. The distance in Z of all the pieces from the center in that particular alignment. Whenever I change the alignment by changing the select face input here, I am checking the distance of each of the centers of the pieces from the center of the object in the Z direction. And if you see, we have 22 minus 22, 11 minus 66, 11, and so on. Whenever I change direction, the overall values here do not change. So that is what is going to filter the distance in Z. How am I going to do it? Well, I will drag the expressor node in here, get the select face data out. And if you watch carefully, we have some repeating patterns here. We have two bases and two tips, two bases and two tips, two bases and two tips. And whenever there is a repeating pattern, your mind should go directly to the modular operation. Calculate math function modulo. So we have a repeating pattern every four moves. If this doesn't make sense now, I'm using this operation, this modulo operation, so that I don't have to use the longer way, which is condition, and add 16 inputs here. And for all the 16 inputs, I have to fill these datas with the same values over and over again. So I'm using this method. I'm using a modulo. Of course, I will get a condition node, but instead of 16 inputs, I will only prepare four of them. And let me bring that print to console again. I will check the set distance, I said. And if you watch carefully, the lowest number is minus 66 in the Z direction so the z direction points this way minus 66 is this way so it is this particular piece and 11 are one of the pieces here at the base together with 22 believe me i have checked this so i will check whether the pieces that make up the base are in the positive or negative z direction for the base, they are in the positive. So the positive numbers here are 22 and 11. So for the base, everything that is greater than 1 will be the base. And everything that is less than, say, 60 will be the tip. Make two compare nodes. And I will compare them to the output of this condition. So this condition will output 1 for the base and minus 60 for the tip. And for the base, I will say everything that is greater than 1. And for the tip, everything that is less than 60. I will take another condition. And here I will input the results for the base. And down at the bottom inputs the results for the tip. The switch will also be driven by this modular result. Okay, so this is what will filter the pieces. Where will I put this info? Let me make more space here. And I will create another condition node. This time I will change the data type to matrix. This condition will only output zeros and ones. Whenever it outputs one, 
the pieces will get updated and whenever it outputs zero the pieces will still get fed their original local matrix so instead of having to stretch this noodle all the way i will get an adapter node a universal adapter node change its data type to matrix and so i can create a prolongation of this data without having to interfere with all the other lines so it's a cleaner way of doing things we will feed this original local matrix here and this data will feed it here don't worry if this doesn't make sense to you now but you can build it by following this example and you will understand a lot of things. I'm not a mathematician and I do not have a mathematic way of explaining things but that is great about Cinema 4D and Expresso in particular that you can check the results of your actions right away in Expresso. If you don't get the result you're looking for you can just reset your simulation and rearrange your nodes and the result will be visible right away. There is really no right or wrong way of doing things you can redo them again okay let's test what we have done i will hit play and you can now see that we have created some filtering although this is not quite what i wanted but as i said we can reset the simulation and start over the problem right now is that whenever I want to rotate, let's say, the base, it's not the base that is rotating, but it's the opposite. It, it is what remains from the base. That can be easily fixed because now I can change inputs and outputs here. And I think this will give you the reverse of what we have already. Let me check. Yes, that's right. Now I'm rotating the base and now I rotate the tip. Tip. Tip again. Tip again. Base. 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 Tip. Tip. So let me recapitulate what we did here. We brought the local matrix for all the pieces in the local coordinate of these different axes. And after that, we aligned them back from those matrices. We took out the Z position, checked whether it is or not a certain distance away. And that distance filtered the pieces, whether they got updated or not. In fact, I don't need this null anymore. It was just for visualization purposes so that I could see the direction in which the pieces are rotated. They rotate, as I said, along the z-axis. I can get rid of it here in Expresso as well as in the object manager. And here I have a cleaner setup. So let us check again the result don't forget that the same as if as in the cube example this setup works whether the time is moving forwards or backwards now i'm playing the time backwards and the setup still works this is great when you have to do keyframe animation of the puzzle. And let me demonstrate an animation scenario. Let me hide everything else except the Expresso tag from the timeline. Hide unselected elements. So, first I will create keyframes for the on-off switch. Right now, at the moment, there is no way to animate it. So let me edit the user data. 
by making this on off switch animatable along with the reset pyramid switch. I will add a keyframe at the beginning, move, let's say, 15 frames away from the beginning and turn the setup on. I will also add a keyframe for the select face. Move again 15 frames away, change face, make a keyframe, change face, make another keyframe, change face, another keyframe. Let's repeat the last movement. I will hit repeat. Let's change face, move away another 15 frames. Remember, the key here is that the keyframes are more frames apart from each other than the transition length. That is very important, otherwise you could break the setup. And after doing these keyframes, I will turn off the setup and add another keyframe here. Let us check what we have done. I'll go to the beginning and play the timeline forwards. Okay. And now, let me change the play mode to simple. Let us now play the timeline backwards and in the best case scenario this should animate the puzzle back into its default state yes it did and now we can also change the rotation of the master null and the setup would still work that can even work if we change the master's scale the good thing about this setup is that it works with Expresso nodes only without using the MoGraph module. So it can be built even in the cheaper versions of Cinema 4D. And I have tested it and the scene works even in older versions of Cinema 4D. I have tested it in Cinema 4D release 12. So it should work there too. And the setup works even with the free version of Cinema 4D that comes bundled with Adobe After Effects CC, the Cinema 4D Lite version. Thank you for watching. I hope you have learned something about Expresso by following these examples. My name is Lir Bechiri and I thank you for following me. Don't hesitate to ask questions in the comment section. And please share the videos so you can spread the word out.